I want to talk to you about what it means to die. John 10, 17. Lord, have your way. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. John 10, 17. This is Christ speaking. And for this reason does my Father love me. Because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. Why did he say the Father loved him? Because he laid down his life. In obedience. He's doing this in obedience. I'm going to tell you why Christ died. And, and I have to say this. You have to understand this. He did not die for us. He died in obedience to his Father. No man takes my life from me. No man takes my life from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received from my Father. I want to tell you this morning, there is a place in God where no one can kill you. You understand what I'm saying? Why are they going to do this? They're going to do that. Not unless your Heavenly Father allows them to. He said, nobody takes my life from me. And we're you know, sometimes we're walking around so scared. So scared, I'm going to die in a car wreck. Somebody going to shoot me. Somebody's something. Fear of man. Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. He's on the cross. Cried out with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. Notice, yielded up. He gave up his spirit. What did he say? I lay it down on myself. Nobody takes this from me. I want you to understand something this morning. Nobody can take anything from you, including your life, unless God allows it. And behold, and when Jesus was standing before Pilate, Pilate said, you need to answer me because I, can, I have your, your life in my hands. He said, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You can't do anything to me unless, to me unless my Father allows it. And behold... When he gave up his spirit back to the Father from where it came, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Why from the top to the bottom? Because if it had been a man, he had ripped it from the bottom to the top. You understand that? That showed that God did that from the top to the bottom. God did it from the top. The veil separated the holy of holies from all the rest of it. Now everything is open. If we want it to be open. The veil is taken away. From the very from intimacy with God. You know how the chief priest was only allowed in there once a year. And they tied a rope to him. Just in case he had some sin in his life he shouldn't have. And he'd drop dead. And they'd have to pull him out. And they put bells around his rope. To, to, so they could hear is he still alive? Is he still in there? You know everything okay? No bells? Pull the rope. You know. Praise God. And isn't that amazing how some people come to the house of God like flipping, you know, just doing all kinds of things in the house of God. Disrespecting the house of God. That's what I'm trying to say. And yet back there, even in the Old Testament, how respectful and fearful they were of God. Now there's some that weren't. Two son, the two oldest sons of Aaron took fire in their censers that God didn't tell them to. And God sent a fire to them and burned them up because they did not respect God. Very important that we respect God. This is, this is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we need to fear him. Praise God. And the earth did quake and the rocks split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose came out of the graves after his re Christ's resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now back, that was, that's talking about when he came out on Sunday morning. Now when the centurion, he's the one in charge of putting Christ to death, and they that were with him watching Jesus, they were watching the way he died, the way he gave up his spirit, how he was totally different from anyone that ever put to death, and they put many to death. And when he was watching Jesus and saw the earthquake and those things that were done, 
they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Truly it was. How would you feel if you realized you'd put the Son of God to death? They didn't say an angel. They didn't say a good politician. They said this was truly the Son of God. May God give us some experiences in our life to where we come to the realization He truly is the Son of God. Truly is the Son of God. History tells us that Jesus died, but what does it mean to die? And that's the title of this message, What Does It Mean to Die? We know that Jesus died in obedience to His Heavenly Father's will, but what did it mean for Jesus to die? We, mo we may know the benefit that we receive because Jesus died for us. We talk about that. But what did it mean for him to die? Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Christ died, but we are also given the opportunity to die with him. But do we know what it means for us to die? 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple or the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. Somebody needs to tell us that. We don't belong to ourselves. James um, spoke of that in, in, the, in his epistle. And he said, you that say I'm going to go to a certain, certain city and buy and sell for a year and get gain, I'm going to do this and I'm going to... He said, you know what? He said, you need to say if the Lord wills, I will. Because your life is as a vapor. It appears for a while and it's gone. Now he said, God has given someone to us, the Holy Spirit, sent down from heaven. But I want you to understand this morning, he has not given the Holy Spirit to everyone. People read this, the Bible and they claim those things for themselves and they have no right to claim some of those things because they don't meet the conditions. Read who he's talking to. Read why he said that about them. We can't just reach out there and grab anything, you know. We sing songs. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Are you? Am I? We just sing, we say things, we claim things. You might say, well, you're making it too hard. Well, it is hard. Hard on the flesh. And that, you know why? Because we don't want to quit. And I say we, but, and if, if let me say something. This way. If the shoe fits, wear it. If it don't, don't worry about it. Don't get yourself offended this morning or any time. But we have to tell the truth in love. Now, some people interpret that, tell the truth in love. You just can't say that to me. If you love me, you wouldn't say that. No, because we love you, we tell you the truth. Speak the truth because you love somebody. Speak it if the Lord tells you to, when He tells you, where He tells you, how He tells you. In Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name, that means the image or likeness of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But not everyone's going to receive the Holy Spirit because the sanctuary, uh, and become the sanctuary that the Holy Spirit lives in. Not, not everybody's going to do that. Not everyone sitting on a church pew is going to do that. I don't mean this ugly. Not everyone in here is a sanctuary or the temple of the Holy Ghost. I, 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 so there's life in this thing. It's not just, as I said earlier, a set of rules or beliefs. And I, How can he be living in us and us act like we're half dead? Something wrong with that picture. He is a lie. Acts 2.17 quotes an Old Testament promise, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, but God's not going to pour his spirit out on everyone. He's meaning the, you have to see who he's talking to. The all of the people he's talking to. Acts 5.32 tells us plainly that God is only going to give the Holy Spirit to them that obey him. He's not a Icing on the cake, make things easier, better, make us powerful, give us power. Our body's not our own. 
And if you will, just look at your hands, look at whatever you can see of yourself, and tell yourself, this is not my own. Not my own. I can't put on it what I want to put on it because it's not my own. I can't take it where I want to take it because it's not my own. I can't say out of this mouth what I want to say because it's not my mouth. I can't listen to what I want to listen to because these are not my ears. These are not my eyes. I can't look at what I want to look at. Well, praise God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Understand that. Well, I like that. Well, where does that leave you? Out. Out. Go ahead. Take your body and do what you want to with it, but you'll regret it. If you don't regret it in this life, you'll regret it when you stand before God. We will give account to God for what we do with this body. So I'm going to be real careful what I do. With. No, that's not what he's saying. Listen to God. Be led by the Holy Spirit by, with, concerning what you do with your body. All of us. It's not our own. It belongs to God. He has chosen our bodies. This is very important to be the house that the Holy Spirit lives in on this earth. What is the purpose of your body? So God can live in it. But not everyone's coming into that purpose. This temple, the sanctuary, the house is the house that God lives in. It's not, it's not a material building made by man. In, in one place it says not made by men's hands. We don't go to church, we're to be the church. And I say we are to be because not everyone that calls himself something in God is telling the truth. As I mentioned to you recently, just because their business card says they're a prophet or apostle doesn't mean they are. Just because their website says it. Just because somebody calls herself that. I know people that do that. You know them, you, you're around them, they just, you know, got a lot of issues, nothing. And, and then it, it pops up on their website, apostle so-and-so. Oh, how'd you get there? <laughs> you know, didn't know that. Our doctor so and so. We went. I, I went one time to a conference and and they had these tables out there and they're selling things. And if you enroll in this little class, this little course, they will confer a doctorate on you and you'll be doctor so and so. Wouldn't y'all like to have Doctor Pinson for your pastor? You know, sounds good, doesn't it? But it's not. Come on now. What does it matter? I, can you see Paul going and Peter going around calling each other Doctor Peter, Doctor Paul? You know, apostle. And that, but they really were apostles. They really were. Just trying to elevate ourselves above other people. Stick out, you know, with, hey, look at me. I need to come back to this. Verse 20, for you're bought with a price. Why don't we belong to ourselves? We're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God or express God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Now everyone who's willing who has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the price paid on the cross. But we must understand what it will cost us. We have to understand. Salvation is not free on his part. And it's not free on our part. It is not free. Well, I thought it was free. It's free in the sense that we don't have to die on the cross. But it's not free because we're going to pay a price just like he paid a price. His blood not only is the price paid for our sins, but His blood was also the price paid to buy our body and our spirit. But remember, and, and let me just say this, everyone that won't let Him, won't give Him what He paid for, is going to lose it. Do you see this? He paid for your body. It's not your own. If you don't let Him have it, you lose it. But... Now, remember, salvation is not free for Christ, and neither is it free for us. So what would salvation cost us? We know what it cost him, his blood, his death on the cross. And it costs much more. We don't have time to go into. Philippians chapter 2 tells you that. What he did, how he left his home in glory, so forth. It will cost us our body and our spirit. That's what it will cost us, which we must forfeit to him forever. So that we become his property, meaning we don't any longer own ourselves. Just as Christ had to take up his cross, so we must take up our cross. 
Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What do you mean, my cross? And some people come up with some really funny things, you know, for what they think their cross is. And let me tell you, you don't get to pick your cross. You know that? Just as Christ had to die to himself, so must we die to ourselves. And that's really the gist of the whole thing, dying to ourselves. This is what God's eternal thought is for all of us, that we deny ourselves or die daily to ourself, our own will. There was a song published in 1693 which says, and we still sing it sometimes. It's in our songbook. I think it's in that blue one. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Somebody understood that in the 1600s. Somehow today in the 2000, 2019, people have forgot that. Since we don't own ourselves, we no longer have a right to lead or direct our lives. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the sons of God. It's just as simple as it. Who's the son of God? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. How do you get to be a son of God? You be led by the Spirit of God. In other words, if I'm doing what I want to do, then I'm not a son of God. Well, I'm partly doing what he wants me to do. We wouldn't probably admit that. Well, you know, Saul tried that thing and he lost everything. This is, this is what it means for us to die. We must die to direct in our own lives. Christ did not direct his own life. Luke 4, 1 says he was led by the Spirit, full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit. Now, this is what it meant for Christ to die. He must die to direct in his own life. Philippians 2, 8, Christ being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now for some, we like that being exalted, don't we? I can, or can you just see yourself riding around in that fine truck or automobile, living that, oh, God's going to exalt me. People are going to come and bow before me. I don't know about that, but for some of us, due time, he said, in due time he'll exalt you. Due time to be exalted may never come in this life. Because being exalted would ruin many of us. Wouldn't it? Absolute money would ruin most of us. We, it would. I know people that it ruined. I knew a man, they went to church here many years ago. And they didn't even have a vehicle. And I, I've loaned them the church van. Because they didn't have a way to get to church. And they lived in town. His grandparents died, left him a quarter of a million dollars. It absolutely ruined him and his family. That was a lot of money back there, too. Now, since we don't own ourselves, we no longer have a right to do our will. For now we must do the will of him who bought us. We don't really maybe understand the concept of being a slave. And even those who understand it perhaps despise it. And this, this country has a history that's not good on that. But being his slave is a mighty good thing. You hear me? It's a mighty good thing. This is what it means for us to die, for we must die to do in our own will. Luke 11, 2, Jesus said unto them, When you pray, our, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, Holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven, so in earth. That's what I, I, I try to pray that regular. Your kingdom come. But not over there, over there in here. Not somebody I want, God, I want you to make them do this or that. Your, your will be done. No, in me. Your kingdom come, your will be done in me and in my life, my situation, circumstances. 
Our will is not His will. And never shall be His will. Isaiah 55, 9. For as the heavens are higher or greater than the earth, so are my ways higher or greater than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. May God help us to understand that. Since we're bought with the price of Jesus' blood, God's eternal purpose for us is to glorify God. Listen, I got to tell you something this morning. We sang about His blood. His blood brought, bought our forgiveness. As I said, though, His blood also bought us. And we like to think about His blood being spilt for us, shed for us, that we could be forgiven of our sins, and we want to go on our way then. God's eternal purpose for us is to glorify God. Hear this. To manifest, to reveal, and to be a true representation of the image of the person of Christ in our body and in our spirit. 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. King James says peculiar people. It simply means a special people, or people belonging to God. That you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Do we, do we know what darkness we were called out of? Do we understand how dark it was, the darkness we were called out of? Do we understand that it's a marvelous light? What were we chosen for? We were chosen to belong to God. Well, I thought he chose me to make me the head, not the tail. That's the scripture people like to quote. We were chosen to belong to God. Oh, that God could get a people that understood that they belonged to Him and they would begin to seek His will and do His will. What would that be like? Here we see the same eternal thought and purpose of God, to have a people called out, separated from darkness, unto God, to manifest, to reveal, to be a true representation of the light and the life that is found only in the image of the person of His Son. And have this in their body and in their spirit. As I said, I believe it was Wednesday night. Like a city built on a hill. That's what we're to be. A light shining. Not our light, His light. Now, are we chosen to obtain some benefit for ourselves? Is that, is, is that what He's chosen us for? Is God's eternal intention and purpose something for ourselves? Well, let me read you these verses here. Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, All things are of Christ, through Christ, and to Christ. So take your name out of there. Colossians 1, 16 says that all things were created by Christ and for Christ. Let's take our name out there. Whose name goes in there? Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. Where does that leave us? Does it leave us with nothing? It's all made for Him, not for us. It does leave us with nothing, but that nothing is Christ. And we're complete in Christ. That's what we're left with, Christ. We're complete in Christ. How, why would we want more? Running around like Look at our lives. Running around, pressured all the time. Disturbed, agitated, upset. This not working, that's not working. So and so didn't do what they said. Somebody lied to me. Somebody lied on me. Just running around, grabbing and snatching and clawing. Why? We're complete in Christ. If we'd really believe that and begin to live that way, some of that tension and pressure on you, all of it should go away. If we suffer with Christ, meaning die with meaning to die with him, then we'll be a joint heir with Christ. Romans 8, 17. 
Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but you are now the people of God. Which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. But see, you have people running around, I'm the, I'm the people, I'm part of the people of God. Oh, I'm the, you are? How are you? How are you the people of God? Do we qualify? Now, who obtains mercy? Only the people of God can obtain mercy. How can we become the people of God? We have to answer that. John 1, 12, But as many as received him, Christ, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And to believe on his name is more than believing in a person or what a person has done for you, but it's to believe in the image of the person of Christ. The na name actually means that. Name means the image of Christ, the likeness, the character, and the nature. Now why must we die? 1 Corinthians 15, 49. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That's quite a chapter there, verse 15. And Jesus said in John 8, 23, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. That's kind of a difference, isn't it? Everybody. Where are we from? Beneath. Where is he from? Above. Where are we from? The world. Where is he from? Heaven. We were born of this earth. In fact, we're made out of earth. Dirt. That's almost an insult, isn't it? It doesn't matter how pretty our face is and how good our hair looks and all that. It's all dirt. Praise God. It's all dirt. You don't believe that? Anybody here don't believe that? They'll dig you up someday if they do. What will they find? Dirt. <laughs> dirt. Some of it's black dirt. Some of it's white dirt. I don't know. So it's red dirt. Actually, when they were building the lake here, they had to move some five cemeteries. And I was friends with a guy who's a funeral home director and it was by law they had to have a funeral director out there some of those graves were very old and they'd be digging and what they did when they found the darker colored dirt they dug that dirt up and put it in a bag and moved it in the headstone to another cemetery that's how they knew they found them oh hallelujah that does make you excited this morning we think so highly of ourselves and we're just dirt I see y'all just you're getting excited about it, the fact that we're all dirt Praise God. It's not about this body anyway, is it? It's about what's in here, what God put his, his spirit in here. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Don't get too caught up with your body. Amen? Don't pamper it too much. Take care of it. Don't pamper it too much. Don't live for it. Oh my, there's so much we could say. We were born of this earth, therefore we must now be raised up from the earthly and begin to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. We cannot, while in this earthly image that we are born with, we cannot sit together with the risen Christ. Why? Because he's the image of the heavenly Father. We're earthly, he's heavenly. Only as we die to our earthly image can we be changed to the image of Christ. So there's got to be change. Now our bodies, I uh, mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, says our bodies will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal must put on immortality. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's talking about the physical, but there's also the spiritual. And if we're changed into the image of Christ, the spiritual, we can sit together with him in heavenly places. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Now there's more than just agreeing with what we know about Jesus Christ. It's more than just knowing it. It is to become agreed with His image. I, I want to. We've got to understand this, or to be changed in the same image of Christ. This is to receive power to become a witness unto Christ. Acts one eight, or to be changed in the image of the person of Christ. When we're changed from our image into His image, it's a lifelong process, then we are agreed or aligned with Christ. Then we're agreed and we can walk together. Is everybody understand that?
can't walk with him unless you're agreed with him. How do you get it? Oh, I, I, I agree with what he says. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about we, what we are, become what he is. Agreed. Agreed. You ever try to fix a piece of machinery or something? And you, you know, you've got to get the right parts or they're not going to fit and it's not going to work. Okay, they don't, they've got to agree. You, you wouldn't put, and, and you wouldn't, if, you're, if your car motor messed up and, and some of the gears in there, cogs in there broke, you're not going to go get some wood and cut a piece out of a wood and stick it in there when it should be steel. It has to be in agreement. Okay? We have to be in agreement with him. We're dirt. He's not. We're earthly. He's not. We have to come into agreement. I want to stress that this morning. How's that going with you? How, how's it coming along with you? Is anything changing? Is anything happening in your life concerning God? Well, I needed somebody to pay my bill, and I asked him to, and he, and he did it. No, that's not, what we're not, that's not what we're talking about. Praise God. Something more important than paying our bills. I like to pay my bills, but there's something more important. He is our source. We can walk together and sit together in heavenly places with Him when we're in agreement, when we're changing to His image. When must we die? 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. 2 Corinthians 4, 11, For we which live, that's meaning unto Christ, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. What sake? The sake of coming, our coming into His image. How does that happen? We have to be delivered over to death for us to be changed. Something's got to get out of the way for the new to come in. If we're full of ourselves, how is Christ going to come in? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh or our present body. Our dying to ourselves is not a one-time event, but it's a continual, ongoing experience. I'm telling you, it's forever. This is not an imaginary death or just identifying with Christ's death. I've heard people preach that. And we identify as we go merrily on our way. What does song say? Must Jesus bear the cross alone? What did Jesus say? Take up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself. That's what he's talking about. Always being delivered over to death is something we will feel the pain and the humiliation of. You and I, being delivered over to death is not a concept. It's a reality, and we're going to feel it. Are you hearing me? Are you going to feel it? This daily dying is a result of real events that chase us down and fall upon us. Real events. Some lasting only a short while, while others may last many years or even a lifetime. But if it, if it will humble us enough that will turn to Him and let Him do a work in us, and it's worth all of it. We've got to quit living for ourselves. Some of our always been... I hope I'm talking to a group of people here that want to go to heaven. Well, I thought I could just believe on Jesus and I'm in. Somebody lied to you. Some of our always believing, being delivered over to death will be felt in our body. Some in our emotions. Some in our finances. It's delivered over to death. Some in relationships with others. You'll lose those relationships or they'll be strained. Everyone in here has lived long enough knows what that is. It'll be in temptations and afflictions and disappointments. So disappointed it'll take time to recover from it. In our failures, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. A million times I wish I hadn't have done that. Can't go back and redo it. Undo it. In our failures, in the loss of things. Or the loss of our reputation and our honor. You know you see tragedy come to communities. Maybe a tornado destroys their house and they'll be interviewing. They'll say, well, we can rebuild, but at least we're alive. 
Well, yeah, you can rebuild, but that's going to, that's not going to be easy. Is it? Is it easy to rebuild when your house burns? It's not easy. For a long time, we had to look out those windows and ashes over there where that boy burnt that building down. It wasn't easy. I thought a good punishment for him was to give him a teaspoon and make him go out there and clean it up. The whole thing. That'd make me feel good. Watch him do that. <laughs> Praise God. No, the Lord told me to forgive him and let him come back to school. And then some people didn't like me for that. Well, what we do? And Jesus forgave us. Hallelujah. Now, I want to tell you this, what God showed me. And that's why I'm preaching this message. You thought I just picked out a, maybe you thought I picked out an Easter message. No, this is why. One morning last week, early, I was asking for the Lord to come. I was praying in, in our little living room and reveal himself in me. And I, I, the Lord gave me a short vision. And this is what it was. The Lord came into my innermost being. That's where he comes, in here. We're the sanctuary, the temple. But I saw myself there, in there, as a large potted plant, sitting on, on a table in a place of honor. I can, st I can still see it. It's pretty tall. Special. Pretty. He came in. When he came in, I was a potty plant. I fell off the table onto the floor as a dead plant. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. If he comes in, you're going to die. If you won't die, he's going back out. I'm going to put up with it. He's not going to change one thing to suit you or me. He does not compromise. He does not negotiate. When he told that rich young ruler what he had to do, and the guy walked away from him, he did not chase him down. Let's work this out. The Holy Spirit showed me that this is what it means for Christ to come into my body, into my spirit. I must die. If Christ comes into me, then I'll be crucified as he was. You know, I talked about all those things that can happen to us. Afflictions, you know, financial problems, all these things. Let me tell you something this morning. They're going to come anyway, whether you belong to him or not. But at least, if you belong to him, they can work a good work in you. But they're going to come anyway. You will not escape it. Praise God. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I preached, as I told you on that verse, many years ago. And I preached on it for weeks. The longer I preached on it, the less people we had. Make you not want to preach a, a verse. Just one verse. Why? Why this verse? Because it talks about us not living our life, but Christ living his life in us and us being crucified. And people don't want to hear that. And you and I don't want to hear it. Not really. Not in the flesh we don't. If you want a church full of people, you don't say that. You tell them how God's going to bless them out of their socks and give them everything they want. Tell them what they want to hear. Sing the songs they want to hear. It's not just that I was crucified, but rather that I am crucified. Read some translations, they'll change it to have been. But it says am, meaning present, ongoing state of being. We all must remain in a perpetual state of being crucified. I die daily. I'm always delivered over to death. Dead to ourselves, our will, our plans, our desires, our rights. Did you ever ask God if that's what he wants you to do? Did you ever ask him that? It's not just that I momentarily die to myself and then I can jump up and run on living my life again and be in charge. We all like to be in charge. You see that? You see a group of two people, one of them is going to try to be in charge. The more people there are, the bigger conflict you got. Somebody trying to be in charge, be king of the hill. You get on top, somebody's going to try to knock you off. Praise God. To be crucified with Christ means my death. It means that I remain dead. I remain dead to myself and to this world and dead to all that is in it. And, the, and that's, that's addressed in 1 John 
He said, if we love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in us. It means that I'm falling down upon the floor just as the potted plant was falling over dead. What does it mean to die? When Christ said to his heavenly Father, not my will, but your will be done, what did that mean? That's, he prayed that in the garden when he was right before he was arrested. He didn't want to go through with this. He had a fleshly body, folks, that could feel pain, that bled real blood. Was it just words? Not my will, but your will be done that Christ prayed? No, look at what happened to Christ. He was betrayed for money by one of his closest friends and betrayed to those who hated him. He was praying late in the night to his Father in heaven in the Garden of Gethsemane when his enemies came and arrested him. When Jesus, I was in the church when I was young, growing up in the church, and some people didn't like the pastor. He had been there just a short while. He was doing wonderful. The, the board even said, we're losing control. we got to do something about him. He's making too much money. And while he was praying one morning in his office before church, they came and busted in, had a petition to get rid of him. Well, this is worse. He's praying. Here they come to arrest him. When Jesus submitted to being arrested, his disciples and his friends all forsook him, fled for their own lives, leaving Jesus alone to face those who hated him. When Jesus was on trial for his life before those who hated him, one of his friends denied him three times that he ever even knew Jesus and even cursed the last time. And all this was done without, within the sight and hearing of Jesus because Jesus turned and looked at him the last time he did. He was left alone to be interrogated and lied about by some who were hired to lie on him and lie about what he said. He was beaten with a whip of nine tails, ripping his back open. They beat a crown of thorns into his head. And after they got tired of mocking him and beating him with a whip and slapping him in the face, they made him bear a cross through the streets of Jerusalem called the Via Dolorosa or the Way of Suffering. It's still there. You, they think that's the way he went. It's got signs there in Jerusalem. This all was in humiliation before many who had received his teachings and saw his miracles. You know, as he went along, the women were weeping for him. He said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves, for what's coming on this city. Jesus bore that heavy wooden cross in reproach down the streets of Jerusalem, outside of the city, or outside of the camp. You know, Hebrews 13 says, we must go with him outside of the camp bearing his reproach. The word they take him to a place called the quarry, the stone quarry, called Calvary. Now, it's interesting that Jesus was the cornerstone that the builders rejected. That's in, listed in three of the Gospels. The, the stones for that temple that they threw Jesus out of, didn't want him there. The stones were taken out of that quarry where he was crucified. He was the stone that they rejected. They sent him back to the quarry. They rejected him. But he's become the chief cornerstone. He came into his own. His own received him not. Outside the city in great pain, he was nailed to the cross. I'm told, what does it mean to die? Hanging on that cross, Jesus was railed upon and taunted in humiliation before his mother and friends. And it's nice that they put a cloth around his privates when you see it, but he was hanging there naked to further humiliate and embarrass him. And people did some really nasty things to people, to those on the cross. Finally, he gave up his spirit to his heavenly father. Now I want to ask you, are any of us truly crucified with Christ? I had a flat tire this morning. Big whoopee. Somebody looked at me crazy. You read Hebrews 12, he said, none of us have suffered like he suffered. We have not truly been crucified with Christ unless we've fallen over dead like that potted plant, and we'll be trying to get ourselves back up. With all our glory lost, brought down to the ground, listen, there's no resurrection unto transformation to the image of the person of Christ without partaking of Christ's sufferings and death. 
Believers love the idea of being resurrected. Going to live in heaven. Walking on streets of pure gold. To their promised mansion just over the hilltop. But don't, don't, don't be talking about us being crucified with Christ. We don't want to talk about that. Romans 6, 5, For if we have become one together with Christ in the likeness of His death, we shall also be one together with Christ in the likeness of His resurrection. Now listen, we cannot bypass daily dying to ourselves and just skip over to His resurrection life. 2 Timothy 2, 12, If we suffer with Christ, we'll also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. Dying with Christ is a blessing. Many would be as Peter boasted. You know, he said to the Lord there at the Last Supper, before they went to the garden where Jesus rested, he said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Oh, it's, I will. They all may forsake you, but I will not. But his promise didn't last very long, did it? Just a few hours. Then he denied ever knowing Christ to save his own skin. How will it be with us? And I'm almost finished here. We're going to how to remember Christ's death. We're going to do something this morning that's supposed to help us remember his death and to think about our death. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I have received, this is Apostle Paul speaking, there were some problems in that church about how they uh, observed the Lord's Supper. He said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, saying, This is... This cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now we know this is an ordinance in the church that Christ set in place. He set this ordinance in place to be observed. Almost every Christian church observes communion or the Lord's Supper. Some do it differently. Some do it more than others. He just said as oft as you do it. Didn't give it a certain time. Now this is a physical thing we do to remember his death by partaking of Holy Communion. We do this, we're to do it until he returns for us so we can remember. However, the observance of this ordinance will never change anyone into the image of the person of Christ. I tell you it will not. There is a spiritual eating and drinking that will change us into the image of Christ. There is. And we read about it in John chapter 6 where the Lord invited whosoever will to come to him and partake of his body and his blood. This is a spiritual partaking of the life of Christ which will transform a believer. The other won't. The physical won't. But this will transform. You know something. Well, I was taking command and I really felt good about it. Well, that And that's good. It's good. Some people baptize in water, they feel really good about it. Some people come out, well, I'm just wet. You know, it's different. But the, I don't we should not even look to those physical things. Let's look to the spiritual. There is a spiritual partaking of the cup and the bread, which is Christ. Now Jesus said if we in in, in John 6, this is some of the things he said about it. If we do not partake of him, we will have no life in us. If we will partake of him by dying with him, then we will, he will raise us up at the last day. He said that if we will partake of him in the spirit, then we will dwell in him and he will dwell in us. But the, the question this morning, is, is there room for Christ in us? And it can't be on our conditions. He bought us with a price. We're not our own. And then the Lord said, if we partake of him by the revelations of the Holy Spirit, Christ, the Holy Spirit revealing Christ in us, then we will eternally live by him and all that he is and all that he has. Praise God. Will you stand with me? Praise God. Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. 
I, I know none of us are sufficient for this. I don't want to dis, I don't want you to be discouraged or condemned this morning. And if you're trying to do it yourself, if I'm trying to do it myself, we will be discouraged. We will feel condemned. We have to cry out to Him. For it is God that works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Praise God. And being confident in this very thing, that He which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Praise God. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. What I want to do this morning, if you'll come, and I, I just sit, if you will. Sit on these front pews. Sit here on these altars. I'm, I want to let you sit, that you don't get tired maybe standing. Praise God.